everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. A few months ago, a listener named Sophie from France wrote to me. She told me that she was going to be visiting Asheville with her family and that she'd like to meet up. So we did. She took my daughters and me out for ice cream, and we talked a lot about food. During our conversation, it was obvious. Sophie and her husband are foodies. Do you know what a foodie is? It's someone who is passionate about food. They're open to exploring new cuisines and trying new ingredients. A foodie is sort of the opposite of a picky eater, someone who's more selective about what they eat. In general, that means that these two, and actually their whole family, were pretty open-minded. In fact, their trips around the world are often inspired by food recommendations and Netflix series like Feed Phil. Needless to say, we have a lot in common. And she told me that it was because of one podcast episode where I mentioned brisket from Terry Black's barbecue in Austin that she flew from France to Texas to try it. I couldn't believe it. That is one long trip for barbecue. And they liked it so much, they ended up going twice and even bought a smoker, which is essentially a barbecue that allows you to smoke meat. And I have to say, Sophie really inspired me to make today's episode, which is 10 must-know Southern foods. Now, let me give a disclaimer here. We've lived in North Carolina since December, and while I wouldn't consider myself an expert on the topic of Southern cuisine, the reality is I've eaten a lot and researched a lot, and I also spoke quite a bit to my contractor who is from the South. So I think that's a pretty solid combination. Let me know your thoughts and impressions of Southern food or about this episode on Instagram at American English Podcast. And if you want to get the transcript for this episode and all other premium content to dive deeper into this lesson, be sure to sign up at AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Without further ado, let's begin. Southern food, also known as Southern cuisine, is a distinctive and diverse culinary tradition that originated in the Southern United States. But when I say the South, I don't mean the Southern states exactly. The South actually refers to the states that go from Virginia down to about Florida and westward towards Texas. Some people say Texas is part of the South. Others consider it the Southwest. I won't join that battle. The point is, Southern food is a reflection of the region's history, culture, and agricultural resources. And it's also a unique mix of influences from Native American, African, European, and Caribbean cuisines. That's pretty diverse, isn't it? So when you talk to people about Southern food, you'll probably hear a variety of terms. Comfort food, soul food, Cajun food, Creole. We'll cover these terms in this episode. For now, let's just talk about comfort food and the key components to Southern dishes. When people say something is comfort food, they're referring to warm, hearty, and flavorful dishes that evoke a sense of home and tradition. Comfort food like warm casseroles and crockpot meals get me through the cold winter months because they're hearty. H-E-A-R-T-Y. Do you know what hearty means? This is another important word. Hearty means substantial, solid, and nourishing. You will be very full after eating a hearty meal. A hearty meal is not something like a salad or brothy soup. 
Southern food consists of many hearty dishes, and they include things like meat, corn, rice, and a variety of beans. Those four things you're going to hear again and again. Once again, meat, corn, rice, and a variety of beans. Even in soul food, you'll hear about those specific ingredients. Soul food is a term that you might hear that is associated with African-American culinary traditions in the South. Soul food includes dishes with collard greens, fried chicken, black-eyed peas, and cornbread, things like that. We'll go through other important terminology as we continue. To make this fun, I figured let's pretend you're in the South. You're visiting and you want to figure out what to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we're going to go through having a Southern breakfast to Southern lunch to Southern dinner. Let's do it. It's breakfast time. What should you eat? Well, typically, if I go to a breakfast restaurant, I'll order French toast, waffles, or maybe an omelet. But if you're in the South and you're open-minded, so you're not a picky eater, you've got to try either grits or biscuits and gravy. Let's start with grits. When I was a kid, my dad was the only person I knew who talked about grits. His mom, so my grandma, was a Texan, and so she had grown up eating them. Grits are a warm, comforting porridge made of cornmeal that can be eaten either sweet or savory. My dad had a sweet tooth, so he liked them sweet. My contractor, Kevin, who's from the South, said he grew up with grits, ate them every day for breakfast, but he had them with butter, so they were savory. Grits are everywhere in the South, and it's because of Native Americans. By Native American, I mean American Indians, indigenous tribes. So the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, the list goes on. I hear a lot of non-Native English speakers consider me a Native American, but once again, Native American refers to indigenous tribes. Don't make that mistake. So Native Americans introduced grits to early settlers through their practice of grinding corn into a coarse meal, known as cornmeal. And they used this cornmeal to make a variety of dishes, including the porridge-like food that was boiled and eaten. Let's call it grits (laughs) 1.0. And then European settlers learned the corn grinding technique, took their recipe, and then jazzed it up by serving them with butter, cheese, and even shrimp. Today, if you go to a breakfast restaurant or lunch place or even dinner place, you will find shrimp and grits on the menu. And I'll be honest, the idea of having shrimp with grits was very confusing to me at first. In my mind, grits were like oatmeal. That's the way my dad had eaten them. So the idea of putting shrimp in oatmeal, well, it was very off-putting. When something puts you off or something is off-putting, it's somewhat unappealing or unpleasant. It makes you want to walk away from it. In the beginning, the idea of shrimp and grits was off-putting. But now I'm a firm believer that it's a very good match. It's creamy, it's comforting, and grits do go well with savory ingredients. Some chefs will add bacon, garlic, and lemon juice to the creamy grits. Why not try it out? A lot of people have it for breakfast. In fact, Originally, it was a fisherman's breakfast in the Carolinas and in Georgia. The second option is, of course, biscuits and gravy. Now, what's 100% confusing for English learners is that in British English, biscuit refers to a sweet, hard, baked good, what we would call a cookie. While in American English, so for us, a biscuit is a soft, leavened bread product, kind of like a scone. It's just warm and soft and yummy. Now, biscuits and gravy have their roots in the South as a hearty and affordable meal for working folks like farmers. 
as you probably know, the South has a lot of agriculture. And for the farmers who had a farming lifestyle with early mornings, they needed a big filling breakfast. Biscuits and gravy fit the bill because it was made of basic pantry ingredients. Biscuits are made with flour, baking powder, and milk, while the gravy comes from meat drippings, flour, and milk, and sometimes even sausage. So the result became a rich, comforting Southern classic. Have you ever had it before? What are your thoughts? I asked my contractor about this, and he said that if you are in the South, you should try Bojangles. It's sort of a marriage between McDonald's and KFC, and it's where you can get fast food, biscuits, and gravy. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but it's very pleasant, and it's more subtle than the gravy that I grew up with. So definitely try it. That would be another good breakfast choice. So we had biscuits and gravy and grits, or possibly even shrimp and grits, for breakfast. Let's move to lunch. Have you ever seen a TV show where the host goes from one restaurant to the next, trying many, many different dishes? Maybe you're familiar with the late Anthony Bourdain or David Chang or Phil from Feed Phil. And we've got a lot of shows with that premise. And I have to say, if you want to know Southern food, maybe you should be like a TV host. Go big or go home. In other words, you've got to be ambitious and bold. Maybe order new things and lots of them. If you're in Louisiana, you have to try Creole food, which is a blend of French, Spanish, African, and Caribbean food, or Caribbean. That includes dishes like gumbo and jambalaya. If you're in Florida, maybe you've got to try a Cuban sandwich. The point is go big or go home. And then you might need some bigger pants. (laughs) So for lunch, we'll start with something very unique. Number three, crawfish or a crawfish boil or low country boil. So when I was a kid, there was a creek near my house. And in the creek, there were a lot of crawfish. In California, and as I recently found out, also in North Carolina, we call these crawdads. But just know that crayfish, crawfish, and crawdads are the same thing. They are small, freshwater crustaceans that sort of look like tiny lobsters. So you'll find them in rivers, ponds, lakes. They are freshwater crustaceans. Say that five times fast. So while at the creek, My brother and I would pull up our pant legs and walk into the water with homemade nets and a bucket, and we would try to catch them. Occasionally we did, and we'd transfer them from our nets into our buckets and watch them swim around. When we got bored, we'd let them go. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized people eat crawfish, and a lot of them. According to Bevy Seafood Co., the southern state Louisiana provides 70 to 90 percent of the crawfish consumed in the United States, which is more than 150 million pounds of crawfish harvested each year. In many areas of the South, crawfish are the center stage for family gatherings, specifically crawfish boils, which are so unique. A crawfish boil is an event where fresh crawfish are boiled with seasonings, corn, potatoes, sausage, and other vegetables. And when the ingredients are cooked, the mixture is then poured over a large table covered in newspaper. The table, in a way, is the plate. And then everyone stands around the massive heap of food for a communal, hands-on eating experience. Is this all over the South? You'll come across low country boils in Georgia and South Carolina, especially along the coast. The main difference is that they often use shrimp as the star instead of crawfish. And the main seasoning is Old Bay, 
rather than the somewhat spicy Cajun seasoning you might find in Louisiana. Crawfish boils or low country boils are usually festive events outdoors, including music, drinks, and a lot of socializing. While they're not as common in North Carolina, you can definitely find them. Here, it's all about the hog. Which brings me to number four, pulled pork barbecue. Let's start with the word hog. You know the Lion King, right? Timon and Pumbaa? Hakuna Matata? <laughs> yes, Pumbaa was a warthog. But hog, on its own, is a commonly used term to refer to pigs. Hogs are raised primarily for their meat to create products like pork, bacon, ham, and sausages. I know the vegetarians out there won't like this part of the talk, but hang with me. It'll get less meaty in a second. Pulled pork is a southern favorite, and it's rooted in the region's long history with hog farming. Hogs, apparently, were easy to raise, and they provided a lot of meat, making pork a staple in southern diets. A staple refers to something that is regularly eaten. It's like the bread and butter of a diet. North and South Carolina are particularly famous for pork barbecue, with North Carolina being the second largest pork producer in the U.S. The tradition of slow cooking pork over wood originated with Native Americans, and it was adopted by settlers. The result? was very tender and flavorful meat. North Carolina boasts two main barbecue styles. Eastern North Carolina features whole hogs cooked over pits, served with a tangy vinegar-based sauce, while Western North Carolina, also known as Lexington style, focuses on pork shoulder and pairs it with a sweeter tomato-based sauce. Now, there's plenty of rivalry between the two styles, each claiming they have the best recipe. Meanwhile, in South Carolina, they're known for, obviously, pork barbecue, but they have a mustard-based sauce, which they also call Carolina Gold. Now, barbecue in the South is a big deal. There are actually barbecue trails throughout. In other words, there are curated routes designed to guide travelers through some of the most iconic and authentic barbecue spots across different states. Each state or region has its own distinct style, flavor, and method of cooking. And so if you're interested in checking out different types of food or different types of barbecue, check out those trails so that you can also experience that diverse barbecue culture which of course ranges from those pork-heavy dishes in the Carolinas to beef brisket in Texas. One thing that you'll always come across with barbecue are sides, or fixins. And other than collard greens, fried okra, and coleslaw, one of the most popular hush puppies, which is number five. Hush puppies are a beloved Southern dish. What are they? They're not dogs, don't worry. They are small, deep-fried balls of cornmeal batter, and they're crispy on the outside and soft on the inside, with a slightly sweet and savory flavor. If you've ever had a corn dog in the U.S., it's sort of similar to the outside of the corn dog, and they're often served with fried seafood or even barbecue. The exact origin of hush puppies is debated, but they likely have roots also in Native American cooking. You're hearing this come up a lot, right? Did you know a lot of the cuisine here comes from the Native Americans? Now, one popular legend suggests that they got their name during fish fries or outdoor cookouts, where cooks would throw bits of fried cornmeal to dogs to hush them when they were begging for food. To hush is another way to say to make quiet. Hush, hush puppy, be quiet, hush. You might find hush puppies at a meat and three restaurant. Meat and three, M-E-A-T and three, like the number, 
is a traditional southern meal that offers a choice of one meat and three side dishes. Usually, these meals are served in diners, in cafeterias, soul food restaurants, even barbecue places. The meat options often include fried chicken, pork chops, pulled pork, or meatloaf, while three refers to the southern sides, like hush puppies, mac and cheese, collard greens, cornbread, the list goes on. Number six, sweet tea. At this point, if your mouth isn't watering, you're probably pretty thirsty. That brings me to sweet tea, which is the drink of choice in the South. Nothing says Southern like a front porch, a nice rocking chair, and an ice cold sweet tea. In many Southern restaurants, sweet tea is the default when you ask for tea. So if you don't like it sweet, be sure to get it unsweetened. Or if you're like us and you like your drinks slightly sweet, then you can get it half and half. In my personal opinion, a lot of places go overboard with the sugar, meaning they put too much. They go overboard. So it's kind of nice to do the half and half option. So how is sweet tea prepared? You probably guessed it. It's often brewed strong and sweetened with sugar while it's still hot. And then the beverage is typically poured over ice and served with a slice of lemon. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering what's so special about sweet tea. It's actually more than just a drink. It's tied to another term you might have heard, Southern hospitality. If you're open and chatty, chances are one of your neighbors will invite you inside their home to chat. And when they do, you might be offered a sweet tea or a lemonade. Now, this happened multiple times on my new street in North Carolina, and I can't remember this ever happening in California. Not to say that it doesn't. Let's just say my neighbors sit on their front porches. Uh, they hang out outside in the front yard more here than they do back where I grew up. And it's kind of sweet. It's like they're all ready to talk. Speaking of sweets, let's talk about desserts. Do you eat desserts after lunch? Well, some people do. So when in Rome, <laughs> it took a long time to decide which dessert to mention. Key lime pies, peach pies, and pecan pies are a big deal in the South because key limes grow in the Key West in Florida. Pecans and peaches grow really well in Georgia. I considered mentioning cobblers. Do you know what a cobbler is? A cobbler is a dessert featuring a layer of sweetened fruit, such as peaches or berries, and it's topped with a biscuit-like or cake-like crust. It is baked until the topping is golden brown and the fruit filling is bubbling, creating, obviously, a very warm and comforting dessert, especially because it's also served with ice cream or whipped cream. But the thing is, we have cobblers in California. We have pies, even if they're really good here, even better. But what's less common on the West Coast is banana pudding. Banana pudding. It doesn't sound so wonderful, but let me tell you, I love it. Once again, we have a very big difference between British and American English. For a Brit, a pudding is a broad term that can be used to describe desserts or savory dishes. They include dried fruits, custard, and syrup. But in the United States, pudding is like a custard. It's a creamy consistency, similar to a light yogurt or sour cream. Banana pudding is incredibly popular in the South, and it became that way in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The rise is linked to several different factors, a major one being that vanilla pudding and vanilla wafers became popular, just as bananas became more widely available in the United States. It's also a time when Nilla wafers became a big deal. Now, the next time you go to a grocery store here, look for Nilla wafers by Nabisco. It probably doesn't look very special. Nilla wafers are vanilla-flavored cookies that have a very light, 
crisp texture. But throw them on top of some pudding with sliced banana and whipped cream, and it's mind-blowing. It's been a staple at barbecues and potlucks for decades. So for many people, it also brings about a sense of nostalgia. You've got to try it. That brings us to dinner. So by dinner time, you're probably not going to be very hungry. So maybe you can go out for a light meal or appetizers. Number eight, deviled eggs and pimento dip. As I mentioned before, my dad's mom was born and raised in Texas. And so at family parties, we always had deviled eggs and pimento cheese on celery or pimento cheese on crackers. Now that I'm in the South, I've heard that these are very common at family gatherings. You can even find them at restaurants as appetizers, occasionally. Deviled eggs are hard-boiled eggs that are cut in half and have their yolks, a yolk is the yellow part of an egg, mixed with mayonnaise, mustard, vinegar, and seasonings, and then it's spooned back into the egg whites. Pimento cheese is a spread made from a blend of shredded cheddar cheese, pimentos, which are small, sweet red peppers, mayo, and often additional ingredients like cream cheese or spices. And it can be spread on crackers, used as dip with veggies. It's just a simple, delicious snack or appetizer. Pimento cheese, the caviar of the South. Do you have deviled eggs and pimento cheese where you're from? Number nine, Brunswick stew. If you're from the South, you might be saying, why did you choose Brunswick stew for this list? It's not as common as some of the other things I mentioned, but I really liked it and it has an interesting history. Do you know the difference between broth, soup, and stew? Broth is a clear, flavorful liquid made by simmering meat, bones, or vegetables in water. And it's often used as a base for other dishes. Soup, on the other hand, combines broth with various ingredients like vegetables, meat, or pasta. And it can range from thin and clear to thick and creamy. Now, stew is a hearty, thick dish made by cooking meat and vegetables in liquid until tender. And so it's got a rich and concentrated flavor. Essentially, broth is the foundation. Soup includes more ingredients and has varying consistencies. And stew is a robust, thicker dish. Brunswick stew originated in the 19th century in either Brunswick County, Virginia, or Brunswick, Georgia, with both claiming they invented it. So what is it? Traditionally, Brunswick stew is a hearty tomato-based stew made with a mix of meats like chicken and pork, along with vegetables such as lima beans, corn, and okra. But here's what's nuts. Historically, in Virginia, it was made with squirrel meat. Squirrel! (laughs) Yes, imagine that! Don't worry, they don't make it with squirrel anymore. Today, Brunswick stew is celebrated for its rich flavors. I think it's definitely worth trying or even making at home. It's a great way to use up leftover veggies and meat. Really good. And last but not least, number 10, fried chicken. Fried chicken is a Southern staple, and it originated with Scottish settlers. How could you describe fried chicken? You might say it's crispy, it's got a golden crust, the meat is juicy or tender, and for many, it's irresistible. The thing is, it became popular in the South because the hot, humid climate made preserving chicken challenging, and frying helped it stay edible for longer. You may have tried Southern fried chicken if you've been to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. But have you tried hot fried chicken, like the spicy stuff? Hot fried chicken is especially popular in Nashville, Tennessee, where it originated. Traditional Nashville hot chicken is fried and then coated in a spicy cayenne pepper-based paste or sauce. So it's got this fiery flavor, 
And if you go into a restaurant, you'll actually see the heat levels probably listed on the wall, letting you know how badly your mouth will burn depending on what you order. Definitely might be worth trying even just to <laughs> make some videos for Instagram, see how much you sweat. You might also need to order an icy sweet tea if you sweat too much. Once again, you might come across this type of meat, some fried chicken at Meat and 3 restaurants, or maybe there's a place dedicated to hot chicken on its own. Look for it. Southern cuisine is more than just food. It's a reflection of history, traditions, and diverse cultural influences. From Native Americans bringing corn to the table, to the fishermen of the Carolinas and Georgia introducing shrimp and grits, the farmers across the South who invented biscuits and gravy to give them energy in the morning to work on their farms, there's so much more to Southern cuisine that we haven't touched on. We didn't dive much into Cajun or Creole food from Louisiana, but let's save that for another episode. If you ever visit the South, I hope you try some of the flavors I mentioned today. Maybe you can even spend a day like one of those TV hosts and hop from one place to the next. I know Sophie and her family do. You should try it too. Be sure to leave a review for this podcast if you liked it or sign up to all premium content or season four. You can find the links for those in the episode notes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.